Good evening and a very warm welcome to our last talk for 2021. First of all, an apology to all of you who'd been looking forward to hearing Professor Francesca, Francesca Stavrokopoulou, I'm half Greek and I can't say it tonight. Unfortunately, due to circumstances before her and our control, she can't make it this evening. But the good news is we're looking at a postponement, not a cancellation, and she's hoping to join us in the new year. Instead, we're very fortunate that we can be joined by our very own Michael Marshall, whose picture is famously hanging in an attic alongside that of a certain Professor Brian Cox. Marsh is a very busy man, juggling a number of roles. He's the project director at the Good Thinking Society. He runs the Be Reasonable podcast and is co-host of Skeptics with a K. He's president of the, Man of the Greater Manchester Skeptics Society and one of the organisers of QED. He also edits The Skeptic magazine, and I'm exhausted just saying that. So I hardly need to remind anyone that 2021 has been dominated by the pandemic. So it's fitting that to round it off, Marsh will be talking to us tonight about his experiences with the White Rose, an anti-vax and COVID conspiracy theory ecosystem. Clearly, the more we understand about these things, the better able we are to help prevent others from falling into these rabbit holes. After his talk, we'll have the 15 minute break and then meet up again for the Q&A. Please post your questions at sitp.online forward slash ask. Our moderators will be posting links to this in the chat, along with other relevant links as the talk goes on. It's good to see so many of you here on Twitch and joining in the chat. Tonight's subject is one which can generate strong feelings and opinions. So please remember our house rules. If you disagree with someone, challenge the idea not the person, and make sure that any conversation you have is one you wouldn't be ashamed to have if you were in your living room with your much-loved and well-respected great-aunt. In other words, be nice. Our moderators will be there to help support you in this endeavour. So thank you very much and over to you, Marsh. It's a pleasure to be speaking for Skeptics of the Pub Online. I've been uh, part of the, the team putting together these uh, these events ever since the pandemic started. And so it's actually quite uh, quite fitting that we finish out 2021 with a talk about what's been happening in the anti-vaccine movement, I think, during uh, the last couple of years. Um, Cleo has already given me a very uh, excellent introduction. Um, I am president of the Merseyside Skeptic Society and project director of the Good Thinking Society. And I've got podcasts like Be Reasonable where I talk to people I disagree with. And as editor of The Skeptic, um, what we try and do with The Skeptic is, is to reason with compassion. We try to be reasonable. We try to be critical thinkers. But we also try to bear in mind that the people we're talking about are human beings. Um, they're not monsters. They're not caricatures. We try not to define people by the worst set of beliefs that they hold. And I would urge you, as this conversation goes on, to bear that in mind as we're conducting the chat. Not just the people who might be watching this who would disagree with the things that I'm saying, but the people who would agree with the things that I'm saying too. Um, let's make sure that we treat each other with the compassion uh, that I think is important, the respect uh, that, that I think we should all afford to the people that we uh, we disagree with and the people that we encounter. Um, prior to getting interested in, in tracking the, the anti-vaccine movement and prior to COVID, I actually spent a long time looking at the Flat Earth movement. And I gave a previous talk actually for Skeptics and Pub Online and for lots of skeptics groups around the country, all about the Flat Earth movement. And what I was seeing at the time and what I talked about at the time was the way in, pitch, way in which people, um, when presented with something that seemed to be uh, outside of the mainstream, that many people would look at and say that is, that is patently untrue. Some people come to believe it and some people will, will follow those beliefs into quite extreme positions. And one of the things I was pointing out with the, the Flat Earth movement was while people would look at the Flat Earth movement and say, these people believe the world is flat, isn't that silly and ridiculous and all these various other pejoratives that they would use. Um, I would talk to people and say, well, Actually, the thing that interests me about the Flat Earth movement is that the Flat Earth is just the most visible thing that the movement believes in. But actually, when you talk to people in the movement, they've got a, a, a slew of other conspiracy theories that they sign up to. Um, I've spoken to dozens of Flat Earth believers, including people who lead the movement, who are the, some of the bigger figures in the movement. And I don't think I've found Flat Earthers who would tell you that the Holocaust happened as we believe it happened. They'd have some issue with that. And I said at the time when I was at the Flat Earth convention in the UK that if you walked up to one of the people in the audience and said, do you vaccinate your kids? 
um, I would be very surprised if they said yes. And I said at the time that part of the, the what, what worried me about the Flat Earth movement was that it was driving people to a conspiracy viewpoint, a, a, a conclusion in conspiracy, where they rejected a lot more of the mainstream world than just the shape of the globe. And that... Um, this was an anti-vax movement waiting to happen to a degree. And I hope that nothing would come along to change, uh, to, to, to enact that and make people, uh, uh, make, uh, people um, make that, that anti-vaccine sentiment come out. Obviously, uh, that uh, that did happen. And, and once COVID hit, um, soon after COVID hit, in fact, we started seeing stickers like this uh, around uh, the town where I live. I live in Liverpool. And the, a friend of mine took me took me these photos of the stickers that she saw on her walk uh, down by the river. And these were stickers that were uh, encouraging people to look at the pandemic with uh, with a sceptical eye and to, to mistrust um, what we're what we're being told about the pandemic and to see it all as, as part of actually a big conspiracy that the pandemic wasn't real. And these were all stickers put out by a group called the White Rose. And you can see on the stickers there um, that often they've got QR codes and they've all got uh, all got addresses to Telegram where they encourage you to join the White Rose, to be part of the White Rose Telegram group and start to be involved in the conversations there. So who are the White Rose? Well, as far as I can tell, it, it is genuinely a decentralized uh, COVID denialist movement. So they they spread certain central messages about COVID. I, initially, it was that COVID is a hoax, that there's no such thing as the virus, that this is just the flu being rebadged, and it was all part of uh, a government plot to try and uh, control us. Um, there's messages around masks, that masks don't work, that they're dangerous. And since the vaccines came out, well, obviously the vaccines are dangerous too. And these are kind of the core messages we see a lot in the White Rose. And the way they do this is through a decentralized graffiti campaign. And I'm sure many people watching the chat will have seen the White Rose stickers on the lampposts of their town and on walls and on various other things, urging the reader to question what they're seeing about the pandemic. And it generally seems decentralized. I don't th believe that there's a, a central organization or anything like that telling people what to do. It's, it's all spread kind of organically uh, through people who are seeing the stickers, then getting involved in the movement from there. Every one of those stickers directs people to Telegram and from Telegram, they learn how to spread the message a bit further. And anyone who's participant in the White Rose is encouraged to download the, the latest designs of stickers, to print them out and to spread them around their local town. Now, what's interesting about the White Rose is the name does have historical precedent. It's, 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 it's a, a group that's existed before, or, or rather a group has existed before with the White Rose name. And it was a, a group that existed during Nazi occupied Germany. And the White Rose was a, a group of uh, non-violent, essentially intellectual resistant to the Nazi, the Nazi regime. To, they'd spread uh, graffiti, they'd spread messages, they'd spread leaflets and pamphlets, urging people to question what they were seeing about what the, the Nazi government was doing uh, in, in the country. It was led by a group of students um, from the University of Munich. So this was uh, Sophie Scholl, Hans Scholl, Alexander Schmorell, and, and a few other students. And they would dis distribute their leaflets and distribute their graffiti to try and get people to wake up to the tyranny of the Nazi regime. And this is what the White Rose originally was. And it was it started in June 1942 and it, it quickly ended in 1943 in February uh, when the leaders of the movement were found by the Gestapo and they were arrested and executed. And you can see there's a, a monument to the, the White Rose uh, in uh, uni the University of, M of uh, Munich there with the leaflets from the White Rose sort of memorialized on, on the floor there. So I think it's interesting interesting that this new COVID conspiracy group is taking its name from the White Rose, and that's how they see themselves as standing up to the modern fascism of the pandemic uh, misinformation as, that, as, uh, as many would have, as they would have it. But the modern White Rose um, is all about these, these, the heart of it is, is the stickers to try and uh, to get uh, the, the population to wake up to what's, what's going on. All the stickers have a very similar look and feel. I'm sure many of you will have seen them. Um, they're all this kind of monochrome design. They're often filled with clip art with the same font. They're designed to be very low effort to put together, low effort to print, low cost to print, and easy to distribute. And the messages on the stickers fall into several broad categories. I've got a, a full pack of the stickers, uh, and I want to sort of talk you through some of the broad categories. So there's the category of there's no such thing as the virus. This is one of the early uh, white rose stickers and a classic of the genre. You know, there is no pan pandemic. Your own government is waging psychological warfare on you. And it's for me, this is just this is denial of what's happening uh, when the when the 
when the the pandemic started, all of our lives were suddenly um, put on hold. Everything got very, very strange very quickly for all of us. And it's natural that some people would find it very hard to deal with that. And some versions of dealing with it is to is to have a, a kind of denialist approach. Um, this isn't as bad as we all think because it isn't true. Because if it was true, it would be really, really terrifying. And I can't really necessarily... Uh, uh, cope with the fact that it's terrifying and therefore we just reject it outright. And we see this rejection outright of the, the pandemic. Even to this day, 18 months or more into the pandemic, we still see people saying there is no virus. Uh, it's all just big hawks. Now, of course, if this really was just a psychological warfare that your government is waging on you, it would have to be every government in the entire world all collectively deciding to do it because every government that I'm aware of, other than maybe North Korea, acknowledges that the pandemic is real. Now, either that's because the pandemic really is real and there really is a virus, or it would have to be that all the governments in the world are working together to pull this mass trick on the entire global population. So once you start to believe that there is no pandemic and it's just a trick by your government, it has to be a trick by all the governments, which means you have to believe there is mass collusion across the entire world. We see stickers like this. A genuinely deadly pandemic wouldn't require a 24-7 government and corporate media fear-mongering campaign to make you believe that it's real. And this one interests me because... Absolutely right that the government has been talking about COVID quite a lot and the media has been talking about it quite a lot. But it strikes me that if there was a pandemic, if, if you were to believe there wasn't a pandemic um, and you hypothesized a pandemic, what would you expect the government to do? Well, you would expect a government to talk about it a lot. Would you expect the media to talk about a pandemic if it was real? Absolutely. So this sticker is really sort of not getting to the heart of what's going on. It's essentially saying that, well, I must be right. Because if I wasn't right, it would be ridiculous for me to be doing all of these things, which for me necessarily isn't the uh, the slam dunk um, disputation of the pandemic that I think this th th sticker thinks uh, it is. Um, regardless of what the pandemic, what kind of pandemic is out there, um, as soon as there is a pandemic, we'd expect the media to be talking about it quite a lot because that's the media's job to talk about what's happening in the world. We see stickers like this. A massive thank you to the unsung heroes who clear the piles of dead bodies from the streets each night. This fundamentally misunderstands the nature of the pandemic that we're under. The people who die from COVID-19 don't drop dead in the middle of the street. That's not the kind of virus that we're suffering from. And in many ways, if it was, it'd be much easier for everybody to accept that it was happening. Unfortunately, what, what happens is the, the virus is bad enough that a percentage of people will suffer quite severe respiratory illness and a percentage of those people will get so severe that they'll be in hospital and a percentage of those will have to go onto ventilators and a percentage of those will die. But they'll die in ventilator wards in the hospital away from the eyes of the public and so people won't see that happening and so we shouldn't be it, it, with this pandemic we wouldn't expect to see piles of dead bodies in the street that's not the kind of disease that this is um, the unsung heroes really are the hospital workers who are doing the work keeping people alive and doing their best under the incredible pressure that they've been under for almost two years now those are the real unsung heroes in this if you if you if you ask me so we have there is no virus. There's other stickers that believe, yes, there is a virus, but actually the problem is masks. And so we see here if face masks work, why do businesses need to be closed? If they don't work, why are we being forced to wear them? This is the kind of binary thinking that we see sometimes with some of these stickers. The idea that if a mask doesn't prevent all transmission of disease, it's completely useless. Mm -hmm. Now, it's true that a mask doesn't prevent all transmission of disease because the masks aren't airtight. If they were, they'd be a really terrible mask and they'd be a health hazard. We can breathe through the masks. But what's important is the way that the virus is transmitting is the viral particles are uh, exiting our mouths on the various saliva drops that we exhale. And the masks are, are a way of minimizing the amount of those droplets that escape. It doesn't get rid of all of them, but it minimizes which ones escape and we can start to cut things down. So what the, the white rose misses in a lot of their messaging is harm reduction. So it's either all or nothing. If it doesn't do 100%, it does nothing. Well, actually, we can actually reduce the harm. And reducing the harm is good enough. If enough people are doing it, it will lessen the way that the, the virus transmits. So this is a fundamental misunderstanding of the pandemic that we're facing, a failure to engage with what the science of the virus is actually about. And partly, I think it comes down to people don't want to wear masks. People don't like wearing masks. People think they look silly in masks. People feel silly in masks and have done throughout the pandemic. And so you see messages like this, calling masks muzzles, saying you look ridiculous in the muzzle. Um, and I agree that masks are a nice thing to be wearing. I don't want to have to wear masks. I also don't want to have to 
you know, live in a country governed by a, a government that took the pandemic so slowly at the start that tens of thousands of people died unnecessarily. Unfortunately, that's the world I'm living in, where we have that government and where we have to wear masks in order to prevent transmission. Um, the idea being that we dislike something, some people will have such a visceral reaction to the idea of something that they'll find reasons to dismiss it. And that's why they'll end up dismissing uh, masks. And we see the same thing with vaccines. So again, this black and white thinking, if, vaccine, if unvaccinated people are posing a threat to vaccinated people, does it mean that the vaccine doesn't work? And there's a very simple answer to this. And the answer is like, no, it doesn't mean the vaccine doesn't work. It just, does, it just means it's not 100% effective. But no vaccine we've ever had has been 100% effective. So the idea is that some people are vaccinated are still gonna get it, but the more people that are vaccinated, the fewer people will get it because for a lot of people, the vaccine will be effective. And if we can minimize the number of people likely to get it, we'll minimize the spread. But we have this black and white thinking in the white rose stickers. It's not just the, the design scheme that is black and white. A lot of the logic in here is exceptionally black and white. If the vaccine doesn't do everything, it must do nothing and therefore we can get away with it. Or we can get rid of it rather, not, not take it. And then we see memes like this. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this meme. We have the, the superhero kind of guy here who's uh, torn between two buttons to press. It, one being we need to destroy the lives of 99.9% .9 of the population to protect the 0.1% that were vulnerable. And on the flip side, if 0.1% of vaccine recipients die from the vaccine, that's a tiny irrelevant percentage. So what they're doing here is drawing a direct comparison to the people who die because of the vaccine and the people who are so vulnerable that we have to shut down all of the economy in order to protect them. Now, this might seem persuasive to a, a gut level when you first come across it, but actually this really does not hold up. First of all, we haven't destroyed the lives of 99.9% .9 of the population. My life isn't destroyed. It's, it's majorly inconvenienced at times. It's been irritating over the last couple of years. It's been quite scary, but it hasn't been destroyed. I've been able to continue living. But let's have a look at those numbers more generally. Is it true that it's a 0.1% either way? Well, if we look at the number of COVID deaths in the UK, there's been uh, what, 146,000 deaths as of today, that's 2,137 per million people, which gives a COVID survival rate for the country of 99.8% in the sense that one in every 500 people in the UK has died of COVID since the start of the pandemic. So the country has a 99.8% survival of the vaccine of the virus being here. How does that compare to the survival rate for the vaccine? Well, we can work out the numbers on that too. So the UK has a yellow card system which tracks anyone who dies after being vaccinated, which we'll come back to in a moment. And so far, that yellow yellow card uh, system has tracked 800, 1,822 deaths. But that's out of 119.5 million doses of vaccines so far across the first, second and now booster jabs, which means... 0.0015%, even according to the anti-vaxxers numbers, are the ones that have died of the virus, which gives the, uh, died of the vaccine, which gives the vaccine a survival rate of 99.999% according to the numbers presented by anti-vaxxers. So you've got a one in 500 uh, chance of dying of COVID. And according to anti-vaxxers numbers, you've got a one in 100,000 chance of dying from the vaccine. And actually, the chance is even less than that, because when we look at what the yellow card system is, it lists 1800 deaths, but it doesn't attri attribute the vaccine as a cause to that. What the, the yellow card system is there to do is to track any side effects that might that anybody might get uh, after being vaccinated. So it can then look through and see whether those side effects are caused by the vaccine or not. So if you suffer any kind of illness after being vaccinated, regardless of what the cause of that illness is, it will go in the yellow card system so they can spot patterns once you're in a, a very large population of people who've been vaccinated. It's not saying that the vaccine causes these things. If you had cancer and you were vaccinated and a week later you died of cancer, your death will be recorded in the yellow card system, even though it was clearly your cancer that killed you. So the, the numbers of people who've died as a result of the vaccine is dramatically, drastically lower than 1800. But even accepting the numbers presented by the, the white rose and presented by the anti-vaccine movement is still dramatically safer than COVID itself. We see stickers like this. This sticker is removable. Gene altering mRNA vaccines aren't. And there's a couple of things to take issue with here. Uh, one is that the, the vaccine with the mRNA doesn't alter your genes. That's not how the vaccine works. That's not what the vaccine does to your body. This is misinformation that's been spread around. The mRNA doesn't stick around long enough uh, to, to have that kind of effect. It just kickstarts your immune response. Um, the other issue I would take is if you've ever tried to take any of these stickers off, they're not as removable as this sticker suggests. It takes a little bit more effort to get these stickers off than you might imagine. So I think this one's wrong on, on a couple of accounts here. Um, 
we also start to see a lot of conspiracy theory more generally coming in. So we have these stickers about how Bill Gates is evil. This is a whole genre of stickers. Um, and it quotes Bill Gates here on these stickers, saying the world today has 6.8 billion people. And now if we do a really great job on new vaccines, we can lower that by 10 to 15 percent. And so therefore it says this is a man who's trying to you know, depopulate the world, who's trying to do this deliberately. It's your body. It's his choice with this badly photoshopped uh, hand with a syringe. Um, what I think is interesting here is that Bill Gates did say all of those words but it's heavily caught mine from what he was actually saying. And I'm not a, a fan of Bill Gates. I think the monopolistic uh, tendencies of his companies were deeply uh, destructive. Um, but I don't think we can put him on the hook here for being a depopulation uh, zealot, because what he actually said was, the world today has 6.8 billion people, and that is heading up to about 9 billion. If we do a really great job on new vaccines, healthcare, reproductive health services, we could lower that by 10 to 15 percent, which he means the, the jump from 6.8 billion to 9 billion, that jump could be lowered if we improve the healthcare system generally, which means that families wouldn't have to have six or seven children in order for two of them to survive through to adulthood, which is the real problem that we have in terms of, uh, of population growth. One, we know from studying uh, countries all around the world that when you increase access to reproductive health, when you increase um, access to, uh, to, to, to safe, clean drinking water and various other kind of health measures, um, the, the population growth slows because people don't have to have as many kids in order to, to ensure that their, their kids will survive to adulthood. So you improve infant mortality and I, sort of counterintuitively, the, 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 the population growth starts to slow down. And that's what Bill Gates was talking about here. It's nothing to do with killing 10 to 15 percent of the population with vaccines. The White Rose has this because of uh, perhaps the, the the reason that they're so uh, they feel so sympathetic to or so in line with the original White Rose is because they see themselves as standing up to fascism. So we see here people in 1940s Germany didn't realize they'd been brainwashed by the media and government either. They see their stance against public health as a stance against fascism here. That this is the government coming to uh, to to impose uh, measures on you. And I can I can understand why people would feel this because. For the first time in any of our lives, uh, we were suddenly under the kind of uh, restrictions on movement and restrictions on gathering at the start of the pandemic in particular um, than any of us had ever experienced. Uh, maybe if you lived through the Blitz and you, you weren't allowed to walk around at night, maybe you'd have experienced something quite similar. But for the first time in our lives, we were experiencing something where we weren't allowed to move around, we weren't allowed to gather, we weren't allowed to have complete freedom that we would have had. And that was disorienting for lots of us. And it'd be very easy to see why that disorientation would, would lead people to reject the premise of the pandemic in order to, to, to understand why they feel that um, it's a bad thing that their, their freedom was so curtailed in order to prevent the transmission of a disease that is definitely, definitely there. And we see, you know, are you going to be able to look your children, grandchildren in the eye and tell them that you were too lazy or scared to fight for their right to grow up in a free society? And what I think is, is ironic to some of this is that this is also from people who will say that, that that you shouldn't be wearing masks, that the act of putting a piece of cloth over your mouth is too much and too far. Well, actually, I think if we were all wearing masks uh, when we're gathering in large groups, we know that it would it would slow this the, the transmission of this virus. And we know we'd be in a much better position as a country and fewer people would be dying um, if, if people people took those small measures. Um, we also see this kind of conspiracy buffet appearing across the White Rose stickers. So we see this, the incremental steps, steps to enslavement, that it starts with no mask, no entry, and then it becomes no vax, no entry. And before you know it, it's no chip, no entry. You'll all need to be microchipped by the government in order to track everything you're doing. It's this slippery slope argument. And I, I think this slippery slope argument uh, fundamentally um, misses the, the opposition in uh, the vast majority of the public and also within the, within uh, people in the political sort of system to these type of ideas. I think the vast majority of politicians don't want to bring in vaccine passports. I genuinely don't think they do. Uh, and I'm against the idea of a, of a blanket vaccine passport too. And I don't think there's any politicians or anybody out there who really believes that uh, we're about to uh, microchip people and use that to control where they're going. That's not where this is heading. But this this paranoid um, conspiracy is, is definitely part of what's happening here. And we see this played out in stickers like resist the new normal, resist the great reset, resist the new world order. So we have the new world order in here, the idea that there is a shadowy cabal running all of the governments from behind the scenes and that we're all just puppets and being played. This is classic conspiracism stuff. 
we see stuff like this. Nothing can stop the great awakening of humanity. I don't think it's a coincidence that the phrase great awakening is used there. That's one of the key QAnon phrases, the idea that one day everyone will wake up and realize we're being ruled by this shadowy cabal of Satanists and, and that kind of thing. And maybe the person who designed this didn't necessarily specifically mean to reference that, but the language is floating around in these spaces. And I'll, I'll come to where these spaces are, are in a moment. We see st stickers like this. So warning about 5G and big farmer enslavement, big brother surveillance, uh, population control, um, chemical engineering, geoengineering, chemtrails. These are all classic conspiracy theory stuff that is in the melting pot of White Rose uh, messaging in, in the stickers alone. And we see things like this. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. One of the things ironic here is many of the white roll stickers actually contain demonstrable falsehoods. The idea that the virus, uh, the vaccine kills 0.1% of people is untrue. But the way that the white rolls are disseminating this is to put these stickers up on every lamppost you can see uh, in order to reinforce the idea, repeated exposure in the, the population to these ideas in order that they will come to believe them as true. So I think it's ironic that the repetition of the white rose messages itself is starting to forward falsehoods, and yet they have stickers like this. And we have a, another ironic one here, live in fear because it makes you easy to control. And this is from a group who wants you to believe that Bill Gates is trying to depopulate the world and that there's a shadowy cabal of people running all the governments who want to put a, a, a chip in your arm and prevent you from access to society. I think this, those ideas are much more likely to instill fear in people. And those ideas, in my opinion, are, are just not based in reality. They just aren't reflective of what's really happening. And you see a sticker like this. Years from now, people will look back at this time and many will hang their heads in shame as they remember the evil they went along with and the heroes that they ridiculed. And when we see the way that uh, people have responded to doctors and nurses who are doing their best in the middle of this pandemic, um, how they will shout at them and, and say that they're part of a, a conspiracy, they're part of a coercion, coercion program by the government and by the shadowy cabal of elites, um, I think... This is the hope that one day they may realize that the, the heroes they ridiculed, for want of uh, a better phrase. So we see stickers like this in the White Rose. We see um, talk that you shouldn't trust the mainstream media. In fact, they have their alternative media. They list the various places where you can get your news from a more honest source. Um, and one of those sources is this. This is the light paper. And this is an alternative newspaper um, which spreads alternative messaging you wouldn't see in the mainstream news, exclusively stuff from uh, essentially an anti-vaccine perspective or an outside of the mainstream perspective. And you can see the White Rose has penned, or someone representing the White Rose has penned an article uh, for the light. Um, and you can see the type of stuff that's in the light paper. Um, masks are dangerous, according to the light paper. Um, the, that COVID is just a rebranding of the flu and of, of other diseases that the spike protein in the vaccine is a toxin and a pathogen. None of these things are true. But the light paper doesn't just focus on COVID. It has a much broader uh, remit than that. So it talks about how the climate emergency is a, is a hoax. It doesn't believe that, uh, that, that, the, that climate change is happening or that green technology is a useful thing at all. It's, it's, it's very uh, against those ideas. You know, the idea that Black Lives Matter is this kind of uh, big, scary organization uh, tool of control. And we have here a, uh, an article about the Clinton body count, the idea that uh, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton have been killing their political rivals in order to control power. Uh, and then we see the uh, the adverts in the, uh, the 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 light, which are for people like David Icke, and uh, we, you can see in the on the, the the far side there, and at the bottom you can see an art, uh, an advert for Save Us Now, which is a, an organisation run by a guy called Mark Steele, who are or he's involved with it, who I'll come back to shortly. Now, the funny thing about The Light is, the interesting thing about The Light is, I actually know the editor of The Light, and I've interviewed him a couple of times for the podcast I have where I talk to people that I disagree with on Be Reasonable. So he's on Be Reasonable in uh, September 2018, talking about the fact that he was a flat earther, because I met him at the Flat Earth Conference that I went to in Birmingham in uh, 2018. Um, and we talked about how he was one of the most prominent flat earthers in the UK. And when I give a talk about Flat Earth. I talk about Darren Nesbitt, the editor of The Light, quite a lot. Um, and at the time, he was just uh, essentially a, a folk singer who was a conspiracy theorist who believed all sorts of different conspiracies. 9-11 was an inside job. The Illuminati's in control. 5G's a, an evil tool, that kind of stuff. Um, and he became a, a leading proponent of Flat Earth in 2015. And that's where I first encountered him and started talking to him. Um, so it was a surprise to me by 2020 that he became one of the leaders of the COVID protests. And he had a song called We Are the 99%, You Can Stick a New World Order Up Your Ass," um, which became kind of an unofficial anthem of the, the lockdown protests. 
Uh, he's actually uh, releasing it as a Christmas number one, and they're trying to get it to the, the Christmas number one, that particular song. And so I interviewed him again in February 2021, so February this year, to talk about his role in the uh, the, the COVID, um, COVID counter-protests against public health measures and the lockdown and things like that. And so if you're interested in what the editor of The Light has to say, you can by all means check out those uh, those interviews um, on Be Reasonable. So we, they have an alternative news source, but they also go out into the streets, not only to hand out these newspapers, um, but to take part in other protests as well. So there's a protest in Liverpool. Um, you can see here there's somebody who's, uh, whose identity I've obscured, um, who was putting uh, the, the white rose stickers all over this police van, as police car. Or if you believe what they said in the uh, the chat, he was uh, a concerned citizen taking the white rose stickers off the police car and presumably putting them onto himself. Um, but this was also, you can see on the on the other picture, this is the march through Liverpool of the lockdown protesters. And what we can see there is signs for QAnon. So big Q and the WWG1WGA, which is the QAnon slogan, where we go one, we go all. So signs here that this isn't just about COVID, this is about other um, all-encompassing conspiracy theories too. And there are believers in the movement who move through those, move through the, those circles too, and who also believe in, in those things. So it's a real hodgepodge of, uh, of conspiracy theories. So they've done protests walking through the streets and in Liverpool they even have this kind of protest where they stand on the side of the road every uh, every week and hold these signs where they uh, try to, to wake motorists up and see how many people kind of honk in support, um, saying that you can't trust the media and that the jabs are evil and actually the yellow card system says how many people have uh, been injured. Again, not fully understanding what the yellow card system is, what it's for, or what that data actually says. Um, and so that's that's something that they've been doing, I think, uh, on a weekly basis uh, since uh, the last couple of months. But mainly the White Rose is aimed at, I think, uh, getting people or a big part of the White Rose is aimed at getting people into their Telegram channels where the majority of the conversation is happening. And for people who aren't familiar with Telegram, it's a, a private messaging service. It's secure and encrypted, which means it lends itself to people who want to make sure that they can't their, their conversations aren't being tracked at all. So it's very, very popular with conspiracy theorists and people in those uh, adjacent circles. And Telegram comes in multiple different formats. You can have your personal one to one conversation like you're just texting a friend. Um, but you have a channel where it's an admin posting to subscribers and the subscribers can leave comments, but they can't just be in a free for all conversation. And then you have a group where its members can talk to one another in a complete free for all uh, of interchanging messages. So those are sort of the three formats of, uh, of Telegram. But one of the things that makes Telegram particularly useful for the spreading of misinformation and conspiracy theories is that users can forward messages from one channel to another. Um, and it'll take whatever image, whatever whatever media is attached, or whatever message is attached, and you can just spray that to lots of different channels. And so you see messages being proliferated across multiple different channels uh, as you do that. And as you do forward a message like that, it comes with a little link at the top to the original channel, which allows for that channel to spread out its messaging, but also recruit people back to it as people are essentially exposed to messages and think, well, that was quite interesting. Maybe I'll have a look at what channel that's from and maybe I'll subscribe to that if it's interesting. So that's how things kind of spread and network around. And so when I saw those stickers on lampposts inviting me to join the White Rose on Telegram, that's exactly what I did. In about April or May this year, um, I joined the White Rose Telegram. And when I when I, when I last gave this presentation, so a couple of weeks ago, it was up to 52,159 or 160 subscribers. So there's 52,000 plus people in the White Rose. And the way the White Rose operates is the admins will pretty much exclusively post the same same types of messages. They'll either post images of the stickers um, in the wild around the world to demonstrate to people how these stickers are really out there and people are genuinely using them. Um, and then they'll attach to those uh, those photos instructions on how to download the latest pack of sticker designs so you can go off and print your own stickers or how to uh, print your, exactly how to print your stickers. So you can see on the messages it talks about which printer to buy. It's always a brother brand of printer. The brother QL8010 or something label printer that you just need to sort of plug your uh, your zip file of sticker designs into and you can go ahead and uh, and just print off a lot of stickers. Um, I genuinely wonder, they often say follow the money on conspiracy theories. I genuinely wonder how many printers Brother has sold as a result of the White Rose. Um, and I think if anybody is profiting from this conspiracy theory, it's probably Brother. And I don't know if the whole thing, therefore, is being run by Big Brother. I don't know. Maybe that is a, is, is, is possible. Um, the other thing that uh, the White Rose main group does is uh, post um, 
the telegram addresses of the local groups that you can you can join so the local activist groups um that are sort of feeding up to this this global level and then once the white rolls post a message people will get involved in the conversation underneath um, to, to, to spread their comments to post their links to cross post from other channels to put videos and and anything they want in there and that's where a lot of the conversation happens but once you start chatting in that space you'll get auto added to their chat group which when i was doing this again doing this talk was about twelve thousand four hundred members in the chat at the time of, uh, of the last time i was putting this talk together um and it's there once once you start to to chat in the white roads you get auto added to this group and then you have this group in your list of groups on on telegram that you'll get a notification when uh, other people are, are posting comments to this group so you, you get this kind of proliferation of channels and you start to see more and more uh, things and you start to get more exposure to uh, to, to telegram and lots of the conversation there is COVID related and lots of it is related to the specific post that uh, that they're, they're commenting on. But a lot of the stuff isn't. A lot of the stuff is just other stuff that's uh, that is that is adjacent. So people post videos and links. You can see here, for example, um, someone posting a post from David Avocado Wolf um, on how to make your own natural hydroxychloroquine. Now, hydroxychloroquine is a is a pharmaceutical. Uh, you can't make it naturally. You can't knock it up in your kitchen. And I think I forget what they were talking about. I think it was something to do with lemon juice and other kind of acidic uh, acidic type stuff. But it wasn't hydroxychloroquine. And as we know from uh, from from Didier Raut's uh, Rusty Razor Award, hydroxychlor hydroxychloroquine has no impact on COVID. The data that suggested that was actually uh, false, and uh, and it's been retracted as a result. Um, but people will cross post material from other channels in there. And so you see stuff like this. So here's just a, a range of ones that I found uh, very shortly. This is all talking about ivermectin um, as the miracle cure. I've seen this uh, has, has really taken hold in the white rose and, and sort of COVID anti-vax groups that ivermectin is the, the only treatment you need for COVID. Um, what they don't ever mention is that the studies which even suggested that ivermectin was uh, was was useful um many of those have been retracted because they turned out to be fraudulent uh, there was one in egypt in particular uh, where they were duplicating patient data in order to make it look like there was more people involved they had uh, admission dates that didn't exist so some of the patients involved they, they were admitted on the, the 31st of june um and they also had uh, other um, statistical anomalies that were demonstra demonstrably uh, evidence of fraud. And the, the, the paper's been uh, retracted. The introduction was plagiarized from other papers, for example. So some of the key papers touting ivermectin have actually been proven to be um, completely fraudulent. And once you take those out of the equation, the evidence demonstrates there's no benefit to ivermectin. But yet it continues to be uh, one of the most touted treatments for COVID in these channels. Um, often people sharing stuff from people like Eric Weinstein and his his proponency of, uh, of ivermectin. Um, it's not the only miracle cure we've seen in there. We see stuff like um, miracle mineral supplement, um, which or uh, CDS as it would go by. Um, that gets posted very often to uh, to the white rose. There's lots of people who would tout that as a, as a treatment. And Miracle Mineral Supplement is something I'd come across before when I interviewed the guy who invented it. I interviewed Jim Humble, I think in about 2011. It's also on Be Reasonable. And Miracle Mineral Supplement is a form of industrial bleach that was being promoted by its believers as a treatment for cancer and for AIDS and malaria and autism and Crohn's disease and now COVID. And drinking this activated sodium chloride is not going to treat your COVID. It is going to make you sick. And when I when I first came across it, um, it was making a lot of people incredibly sick and is banned in many places as a result. And yet it occurs quite often in, the, in not just in the White Rose chat, but in adjacent chats known as kind of a universal medicine. And there's groups dedicated to the spreading of Miracle Mineral Supplement for lots of things, including COVID. But I mentioned that the White Rose posts all these local channels, um, and here's a, a, a range of the local channels just in the UK. So you can see there's lots and lots of different sort of proliferated groups, and it's there that you once you join those that you meet um, your kind of your grassroots activists of the White Rose, and there's much more of a community. So I joined the Merseyside uh, White Rose, which had about 220 uh, followers uh, up until recently, um, and because this is a smaller group and it's a group chat where anybody can post anything conversations develop and you see the same people in quite regularly and you set you, you do genuinely develop a sense of community of people trying to make sense of what's going on around them and coming up with their their answers to that and i genuinely think people um are trying their best to make sense of things i i think often the material that gets posted is highly misleading um well i don't think people realize that it is a lot of it is is either a misinterpretation of data or it's put out specifically 
specifically by people um, trying to get it to spread into other channels in order to, to confuse people. Um, because a lot of what you see in your local White Rose group will be cross-posted material from other channels, from larger channels, from all sorts of different uh, different ideas. But it's here that those yellow card, yellow placard um, protests are organised. It's here that the distribution of the light paper uh, happens. It's here that people will get together to have um, in-person events to try and talk to people in the public. So this is more of an organisational space. And once I was in the White Rose Merseyside, I was also very quickly added to a group called Liverpool Fight for Freedom, which has subsequently changed its name to, I think, Merseyside Resistance. Um, and again, the membership was very similar. The same kind of content would appear. So people would post, would cross post the same material to both channels. And the focus here wasn't just on COVID. It would be on all sorts of other things. So COVID was a big part of it. You can see, for example, the first picture was when um, uh, a Tesco came out and, and talked about how, uh, I think it was when Tesco had an advert with Santa requiring a vaccine passport to get into the UK. People were going to their local Tesco to fill up trolleys with, with, uh, with goods and then leave them lying around for the minimum wage Tesco workers to have to put those things back on the shelves as a protest against Tesco's stance on vaccines. But the discussions here go far beyond um, just COVID. And people will talk about how uh, we don't need to pay our TV licenses or council tax or business rates because we can just opt out of that because of ideas like sovereign citizenship, uh, common law, freemen of the land, these kind of conspiracy theory beliefs that we've seen proliferate in other kind of areas that people think you can opt out of society and the government can't do anything to enforce its laws against you. Um, we can see, for example, on the one on the right, this was after someone posted that um, that uh, 113,000 children go missing in the UK every year. It was part of a QAnon post that made it into my into this local channel. And I actually spoke up at this point to question that number, to say, well, if there's 10 million children, give or take, in the UK, is it really true that 1% of all children go missing every single year? And wouldn't we notice that? And in response, someone pointed out to this meme, which is a QAnon meme, which shows how easy it is to disguise a child, how you can take a child and very quickly put a, a hat on their head and put a, a, a gag in their mouth and put a mask over their mouth and throw a T-shirt over them. And suddenly they look like a different child. And that's why children should be wearing masks, because it contributes to the ease at which the satanic cabal elite are constantly abducting one percent of all children in the UK on an annual basis. So we see all sorts of conspiracy theory stuff uh, proliferate in these spaces. Um, some of it was pushed back on. And I think the organisers actually a, a lot more recently have done quite a good job at trying to keep these kind of conversations um, out of their space to keep some of this, this really obvious misinformation out of their space. But it's a relentless task because this space attracts people who want to push these kinds of ideas, either because they believe in them or other people who don't believe in them but want to push them cynically, and which I'll come to in, in a moment. There's another channel that posts regularly in the, uh, the the White Rose comments, and it's called COVID Vaccine Victims, which had 143,000 subscribers last time I checked. And what this does is it looks for um, the obituaries of people um, who've been vaccinated. Uh, it looks for obituaries of people and then looks back through their social media posts to see whether they've been vaccinated or not. And if they've been vaccinated and they died, they become a COVID vaccine victim. And people try to find any kind of clues at all to prove that they that these people died as a result of the vaccine. But they they don't work very hard to find any proofs. And so, for example, you can see in this one, um, people saying uh, that this particular lady died and people saying, well, I hope her parents are against getting this poison now and good riddance. And she did. This, this woman clearly had no idea about history to even take the vaccine at all. And what we see is quite a lot of gloating about the fact that someone was vaccinated and then died. And I find this really distasteful. I find this really uncomfortable to see. I think this is incredibly poor taste. But what I'd also point out is this for me is kind of indistinguishable in many ways from the Herman Cain Award for uh, anti-vaxxers who died from COVID. And when people share just the same kind of gloating things from people, um, you know, when it's people who who um, would consider themselves to be critical thinkers, sharing and gloating over the death of anti-vaxxers who died of COVID, I think it's a similar kind of thing. And I find them both quite distasteful. But in this channel, anyone who was vaccinated and then dies is essentially uh deemed and declared to have died of a vaccine, even though in this particular case, someone pointed out that her aunt confirmed that she died of a drug overdose and nothing to do with vaccine, that it was very specifically a drug overdose. So it was not at all about this. Um, 
And after that comment was posted, people would continue to put to post um, on the assumption that this was a vaccine death. So there's no real rigor. There's no real um, attempt to, to, to genuinely understand what's a, what's a play here. It's just gathering something that looks like evidence of their cause and accepting it at face value because it agrees with what they were thinking. So I've talked about this kind of cross posting and forwarding and things like that. And this is something that's massive. And I think it's why it really networks these groups together as kind of an ecosystem that messages will get forwarded from channel to channel. And when that happens, the name of the original channel will come along along with a link that people can then click on to go back to that first channel. And I think there are genuinely cynical channel, uh, channels out there who, are, who know that if they post something that is um, about the vaccine, that's about COVID, it will go viral and more and more people will see the link to their channel, which they can use to recruit people into their channel. And so we've even seen in the local group people talking about how they're constantly being added to other groups, to crypto uh, scams and various other things that once you're in a like, users are able to add you to another group automatically and then you have to manually leave. And so people end up in lots and lots of different groups and it will proliferate. Um, but because you're in multiple different groups and this forwarding of, uh, of material will spread across many of those groups, you'll often see the same material posted by different people to, to different channels, which gives this false illusion of consensus because you're seeing everyone saying the same thing without necessarily realizing that they're all sharing the thing from the original source. And that source, if that source is compromised and wasn't doing good due diligence, and I don't believe in, in many of these cases they are, um, then the entire spreading, it doesn't matter how many times people have shared it with you, how many times people have uh, spread it around. This isn't consensus. This is just the viral spread of misinformation. But once you're in one, you'll more likely be in multiple different uh, channels on Telegram um, all around the same area. And this is just a snapshot of some of the channels that I was quickly in after being involved in the main White Rose one, some of which I, I joined because I wanted to see the local channels. Some of them were click things that I clicked on because they appeared in the channels I was in. I was trying to sort of spider diagram which channels are posting where, and some I was automatically added to. The more time you're on Telegram, the more channels you're added to, and therefore the more time you're on Telegram. The more channels you're in, the more the notifications there are to check, the more different things there are to scroll through. The more time you're spending on there, the more prone you are to radicalization. You're spending more time deeply immersed in this web of conspiracy theory and exposed to people who, in my opinion, um, some of these channels are cynically trying to manipulate the people who are following them. Not the, the average everyday, person in in the local telegram group but some of these big channels are putting out the kind of information in order to lure them lure people back into their channel and to to sort of rile them up and so some of the ones that we see for example british nursing alliance which has got more than ten thousand followers this is run by kate shemirani who's a former nurse uh, this appears across the various channels that i'm in you can see it in the white rose chat in the white rose in the the local liverpool group that i'm in so Kate Shemirani is a former nurse who was struck off in June 2021. And I actually knew of Kate Shemirani from a few years ago when I went along to see a uh, a conference of um, of uh, cancer sufferers, cancer patients who were being told by an alternative cancer healer, a guy called Patrick Vickers, that they should specifically stop taking their chemotherapy and start taking Gerson therapy instead. And Patrick talked about how he and his partner, Kate Shemirani were facilitating cancer patients to give up their chemotherapy and to go to his 20, 30, 40 thousand dollar a week clinic in uh, in New Mexico or Mexico um, in order to get Gerson therapy. And Gerson therapy is a treatment that does not cure cancer. And many of these people who are persuaded to, to stop taking their chemotherapy would move on to Gerson therapy, spend the last few months of their lives on an incredibly uncomfortable treatment regime and would die of a preventable form of cancer, or die of a treatable form of cancer because they've been persuaded um, by various people to, uh, to, to take Gerson therapy. And Kate Shemirani was one of the people who were facilitating people into that uh, that transition. Since the start of COVID, she's become a prominent figure in the anti-vax movement. She spoke at a rally at Trafalgar Square in, Live in London, and um, she talked about how she's been given the names uh, of uh, and, and details of doctors and nurses who are handing out vaccines. And she said, and this is a quote, at the Nuremberg trials, the doctors and nurses stood trial and they hung. If you're a doctor or a nurse, now is the time to get off that bus. And this for me is very worrying because this is an incitement to violence. You know, there are lots of people in that audience, many of whom will be absolutely fine, many of whom will be entirely peaceful, but some of whom will take this rhetoric seriously. 
When Kate Cimarroni talks about collecting the names of doctors and nurses because they need to be hung, some people will take that seriously. And that worries me that there's this ramping up of violent rhetoric around the vaccine movement by some people, and some people will, will listen to that. We see folks like David Avocado Wolf, um, who again, you can see just a snapshot of just some of the links uh, at the time that I looked. Um, these are just from one day. Um, all these different links are put across all the different uh, channels that I was in. David Avocado Wolf constantly gets forwarded by multiple different people. You can see that's lots of different people sharing it into lots of different channels. And David Avocado Wolf is a name that I'm sure lots of uh, lots of people watching this will recognise. Um, he's a notorious conspiracy theorist who believes in all manner of different things. He's got a Facebook page with 11 million followers. And the way that he got 11, 11 million followers is that he'd spend most of his time posting um, inspirational memes with attractive backgrounds, quotes over the top of a, 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 over nice backgrounds that would go viral. But then in other posts, he'd be talking about his anti-vax views or his belief that um, that the, the the pharmaceutical companies know how to cure cancer, but they refuse to do so because it'll cost them money. And um, that you can treat cancer with supplements, that gravity is a toxin, that the world is flat, that raw food diets detoxify the body. Um, he was banned from Australia because of this anti-vaccine rhetoric. He still has a platform of 11 million followers on Facebook, and he constantly, his materials being spread across all of these telegram groups that I'm in. And you can see just from the other day in his channel of 97,000 uh, subscribers on Telegram, he's sharing this meme, which is talking about the people who call you oppressors, but own all the banks. And this is very clearly an anti-Semitic meme. You know, the idea that Jewish people all own all the banks is an age old anti-Semitic slur, an anti-Semitic idea. The idea that um, they call you oppressors, but they're in control. This is classic anti-Semitism being smuggled out by somebody who's got quite a reach, whose material constantly goes viral across Telegram. Then we see stuff like Mark Steele. So his channel's uh, got like 17,000 subscribers. Again, constantly uh, appearing in all the different channels that I'm in. Puts out hundreds of, uh, of, of posts over, over, you know, over a day or a couple of days. And the language of Mark Steele's posts do concern me because, again, we see a lot of this violent rhetoric. A lot of the imagery is violent imagery. You know, the mass murder of children. This is a, bio, a biochemical weapon. Justice is coming, be the resistance. It's incredibly inflammatory language and incredibly inflammatory rhetoric and violent imagery in the videos that he shows from people. Um, and Mark Steele, again, is somebody that I know. Um, I interviewed him in April 2018 um, when he was a, an anti-5G activist who at the time was trying to take Gateshead Council to court because he said they were part of the New World Order's regime of, uh, of population control because the 5G streetlights they were installing were designed to kill people, that they were military-grade lasers. And he said he should know because he's, he's worked for the military in weapons technology, although there's no evidence that that's true. That's been looked into and no one can find any evidence that that's true. Um, Mark went to prison in 1993 for wounding a teenage girl with a gun. Now, he served his time, but what this says to me is he was a guy who was carrying a gun at the time. And so when we talk about the inflammatory violent rhetoric, it worries me that this is um, the person who's putting these, these claims out there. I interviewed him in uh, July of this year to talk specifically about his, his, his claims about COVID, uh, about COVID. And what he said was between the vaccine and COVID and 5G, the government is intentionally trying to depopulate the country and that 70% of the UK's population will be dead by Christmas. Now, obviously, this was back in July. Um, it's a few months on from that. Christmas is a couple of weeks away. 70% of the UK population has not died yet. And none of them have died as a result of 5G. Not, they haven't died as a result of the, of, the, of the vaccine. So if that is going to happen, it's going to happen soon. But I, I think uh, I'd be interested to see what Mark Steele's uh, his, uh, opinion of those predictions are now that we're um, coming to the, the point where we've hit his deadline. During the conversation I had with him in July 2020, uh, July 2021, he told me that COVID was created by the actual devil. This is literally the work of Satan. He, he said he wasn't being metaphorical. He literally meant the actual Christian devil was behind the creation of COVID as a tool for depopulating the UK. And his material constantly goes viral across the Telegram channels. And again, what worries me is the violence of his rhetoric. So you see just some of his stuff here. You can see this comparing of uh, COVID-19 uh, to the September 11th attacks. That's an inside job. And he says, you know, until we arrest the, the criminals behind this bioweapon deployment, you know, it, that, that it'll continue to be bad. This middle video was really worrying. So this video, you can see just the bottom of the message. It said, when you find the person who vaccinated your child without consent, and we see a guy in paramilitary gear happily hopping and skipping and dancing his way into the kitchen. When he gets to the kitchen, you hear three gunshots ring out. 
And Mark Steele's comment on this is it's not good waiting until after the offence is committed. It's better to stop a murder before it happens. It worries me that he's attaching that kind of messaging to a video of somebody shooting people who vaccinate kids. And then that claim goes viral. This this post goes viral or a, another post which goes viral and people come to his channel to see this. This ramping up of violent rhetoric genuinely concerns me. And then we see one of the most prolific uh, cross channels that, that gets cross posted in these different uh, COVID channels, which is Tommy Robinson. You can see it here right across the various channels that uh, that I'm in. Uh, Tommy Robinson pushing, uh, talking about COVID. And you can see in here, you know, that uh, people saying the the swabbing of children's nasal uh, cavities is is assault. And Tommy Robinson's channel appears on a constant basis in these various different channels that I see. And this, again, deeply worries me. So people, I'm sure, will know who Tommy Robinson is. His name's Stephen Yaxley Lennon. He goes by the pseudonym Tommy Robinson. He's a former leader of the uh, the English Defence League. He's been a member of several other far right groups. He's got convictions for assault, convictions for mortgage fraud. He's got for convictions in the US for being illegal immigrant. Um, he was con done for contempt of court in 2018 for trying to uh, essentially disrupt a paedophilia trial, which would which would have almost led, which was on the way towards leading towards a mistrial um, for a, 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 a grooming gang. Um, and he's currently subject to a five year stalking order for harassing a journalist. And his channel posts, as best as I could tell, hundreds of times a day. Some of that is around COVID misinformation. Some of it is around immigration. Some of it is around all manner of other different things. But I think, and I'm not an expert, I'm not uh, in the minds of anybody running that channel, but it doesn't seem a coincidence to me that Tommy starts posting COVID stuff and it goes viral in COVID areas. If someone was going to be cynically fishing for recruits, that's exactly how I would do it. If I was trying to cynically grow my group, I would find material that I knew was um, palatable to a, a group of people who's, who are already disaffected with the government. And I would send them that material in order to try and get them to start following my channel and then see the other things that and expose them to the other things that were in my channel. And those other things... I would argue, are Tommy's more core message um, and more in keeping with the previous things he's done as, uh, as leader of the EDL. We see a lot of QAnon groups appearing. So not from one specific QAnon group, but we see messages getting forwarded from Q sources. So here's just a selection of them from lots of different QAnon groups spreading information that is um, either COVID specific or it's, uh, it's, it's kind of QAnon adjacent. So we see a lot of this stuff in there. You know, the idea that um, the Pfizer vaccine left you kind of Wi-Fi enabled or, uh, or, or magnetic, this idea that the first nurse to be um, vaccinated in a county in America collapsed and died as a result. I um, actually looked into that story. The, the nurse was on video a few minutes later talking about how she has this disorder where when she experiences pain, she often faints. And it's not uncommon for people to faint when they get uh, injected. It's not because of what's in the injection. It's because the intervention itself can be quite dramatic and people can get uh, very needle phobic and that can overwhelm people. The most troubling thing that I've seen, and I'm going to give a content warning because this goes into some very uh, uncomfortable and dark places in terms of the the, the racial messaging in here. Um, so if, if you're worried about that, I would I would advise you to uh, to, to take that under account. Um, the, but the, the most troubling thing I've seen is when I first joined, actually, the White Rose Merseyside group. So this is back when it only had like 90 members. One of the first posts I genuinely saw was this talk, a, a lady talking about how um, you shouldn't be selfish and take this experimental vaccine that manipulates the DNA. You should stay away pe from people because you're a living bioweapon. And not only was this posted from a channel with the link at the top, they'd also added their link at the bottom as well. So I clicked through on that on that uh, link to see what the channel was. And the first two posts that I saw there were these two. One talking about this white beauty who loves her own race and doesn't want to be mixing with other people. This is the guy saying that diversity and destruction will be the death of everything white. This is white supremacy. This channel is devoted to white supremacy, but it will put out other material in order to fish to try and recruit people into their channel. So you'll see innocuous stuff like literally cute, cute animal pics. Here's you know, a, a dog snuggling up to a cow. Here's uh, a thing about the blockade in Australia. Here's a thing about the vaccine. These are put out and get spread around the, the vaccine channels as uh, a, a, just a bit of content that's aligned to what you're thinking. But when you click on the, the link at the bottom and, and the channel changes name from calling a spade a spade to are we all being played? So it's the same channel. It just rebranded re itself. Um, when you see these posts and you click through to see them, it'll actually click through to the channel they come from, you're presented with stuff like this. So on the left here, you can see, um, you know, a, a lady in 
Christian knight armor. This is Christian nationalist imagery. If anyone's familiar with Christian nationalist imagery, this is a textbook example uh, of it. Overlaid with where we go one, we go all, a QAnon slogan. And the, 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 the comment on it is, let me at them, I'll take them out. An incitement to violence. It's unequivocal what's going on here on this channel. The other one we have is CNN is saying that white nationalism is, the, nationalism is the single biggest threat to this country, while white nationalists are just out fishing and hanging around and camping with their family. The white nationalists are all absolutely fine. They're not the worry here. They're the good guys. This is obviously clear white supremacy, white nationalist material being laundered into those spaces where people are already disaffected because they're unsure about the pandemic, they're worried about the pandemic, and they're being presented with material um, that aligns with some of their values on COVID in order to fish them into these white supremacist spaces. And I think this is a real worry. Um, and I want to show you this. This one is particularly bad. So this is uh, I'll, I'll skip over this quite quickly, but I do think I need to show it just so you get a, 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 an uh, example of how far this goes. You see on the left here, the meme saying that um, the abortion clinics are filled with white women, while the maternity clinics are filled with pregnant people of colour um, and Muslims and people with uh, multiple children already, talking about how the British will become a minority in their own country because of uncontrolled mass third world immigration. This is the great replacement conspiracy theory, a white nationalist, white supremacist conspiracy theory that there is an intentional attempt by the elites to eradicate the white race by overwhelming the country with people of colour. This is white supremacy. And you can see um, the kind of material they, they post into more overtly white supremacist spaces as an example of the kind of thing that they're really about. So it's really quite horrible, visceral stuff. And it's not just white supremacy directly. Um, you also see specifically anti-Semitism. So, for example, in this calling a spade a spade, we saw the this meme about loxism. Loxism being the worst form of Jew uh, of uh, of racism possible. Uh, it's the hatred that Jewish people have for for non-Jewish people, specifically of white people. And it says loxism is the most powerful form of racism, but you never hear a bit about it on the mainstream media. Why is that? Well, they would allege it's because who's controlling the mainstream media? You know, they have this um, supposed quote from a, a Jewish rabbi saying that the white woman will be forced to cohabit with members of the dark race and the white men with black women and uh, in order to make the white race disappear because they are the enemy of the Jews. This is what this meme is suggesting was said by a, a, a Jewish rabbi, except it was never said by a Jewish rabbi. The person that they're talking about never said this. The quote is often attributed to a different person who was fictitious and the whole story was invented by a white supremacist um, intentionally as propaganda. This is white supremacist anti-Semitic propaganda. And you can see how it works. People saying, you know, well, the Jewish people, they committed the Holocaust and their own people. So who gives a fuck about them? And you see it in the White Rose chat here. Who's running the world? It's the synagogue of Satan with the S's in synagogue and Satan being the S's of the SS, the Nazis. This is really overt stuff. This is in the main White Rose chat here. And you can see the effect that this has, because the people who are turning up the White Rose chat, this is a conversation that went on talking about the genocide of the Jews. And someone here called Tony is saying the genocide of the Jews, even if you believe that happened, the White Rose were over and done with by 1943. Uh, uh, so the, and the alleged genocide didn't begin till a, a year later. So this is nothing to do with the genocide. But he's talking about um, the alleged genocide. Um, doesn't mention that the White Rose were over and done with because the Gestapo killed them. And how do people respond to that? Well, somebody responded to say, I think this guy is a breath of fresh air in this group. Um, you need to get out of your trance. The portrayal of Hitler is heavily politicized by the Western media. Isn't it terrible how political the figure of Hitler has become? His, his memory is being unfairly politicized. Adolf Hitler. How do people, uh, how did the admin respond to that? They said, let's not get into another Holocaust debate, people. We're here to resist government tyranny. And now subsequently, I know that the admins have actually started to kick people out. Certainly in the local White Rose group, they even institu instituted um, uh, hate speech rules to get rid of people who were saying these things. But it was only recently that they did that. Uh, I, they've said that they spend a lot of their time kicking Nazis out, and I agree with them. But we don't have to spend a lot of time kicking Nazis out of our movement. So what is it about the anti-vaccine movement that is a attracting so many Nazis uh, and so many people with extremist views. I think in part it's because there are groups like the this this calling a spade a spade, are we all being played, etc., who are deliberately trying to provoke that. 
We see a lot of talk of the clergy plan, the great replacement, the idea that it's intentionally the case that white people are being made a minority in their own country. It's part of the part of the great plan. That's what the clergy plan is. And we see this being talked about in the White Rose chat. And we see it being talked about even in the local Liverpool group, um, too, and talking about uh, it's all part of the clergy plan. People are swallowing it and they'll only realise once the country is being overrun by terrorists. Um, this is really clearly anti-Semitic material. Um, I have seen people uh, take a take a stand against racism, um, but one of those examples uh, was um, someone pointing to a, a rally of, uh, of people and said, I see gammons everywhere. And that person got a, uh, a warning for using the racist term gammons. So at the time, this was what passed for um, moderating racist speech. As I say, subsequently, I know that it has changed and I have some of the, the admins will actually be saying that they're working quite hard to, to do this. Um, but I remember raising in the Liverpool group the idea that the white genocide kept coming up. People kept talking about the white genocide and that this, this stuff is really, really dodgy and that the channels that it comes from are openly anti-Semitic. And what I was told was... Um, well, people are free to believe what they want. We should stand side by side. The people of Liverpool shall not be shall not be divided. But when the person um, that I was talking about, who was posting about the white genocide, was talking about Somali refugees being brought into the UK in order to push white people out, and they were being brought in by Jewish people, what we're seeing is a message divined, de designed to divide. You know, if you were Jewish and you saw that message, you'd feel a, 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 appalled by it. If you were a person of colour or an immigrant seeing that message, you'd feel appalled by it. It was messaging designed to divide, and it's more, and, but it was more important that we all stand together with the people who were dividing us. Now, I know, as I say, that, that, that the admins will say that's begun to change over the last uh, few weeks. So what have I learned from all of this? Well, Ultimately, I think there's a lot of confusion about what's going on with the pandemic in the White Rose movement and a lot of uncertainty. And that results in a lot of black and white thinking. Um, if a vaccine can't do 100 percent protection, it's as good as nothing. If a mask doesn't protect me completely, it's as good as nothing. And therefore, we should do nothing. Or therefore, the virus isn't real. Therefore, this is an intentional plan. Uh, we've had I've seen people in the same sentence go from um, saying that the vac that the virus was developed as a bioweapon by China, but the whole thing is a hoax and it's just a rebranding of the flu and it's got a 99.97% or 99.7% recovery rate and it doesn't exist. And these are incompatible places. But when there's all this uncertainty going on, conspiracy theory offers the illusion of certainty and the possibility of action. It's much easier to stand up to the evil government who's doing this to us than it is to figure out how to keep ourselves protected from a virus that's quite easily to transmit uh, and, and transmit sometimes asymptomatically. All their arguments are pitched at quite a common sense level to appeal to, to your, 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 your gut thinking first. And I think that's quite persuasive and quite uh, impactful for a lot of people. Um, and I genuinely don't think the vast majority of people in the movement are at all fascists and right wing and, and racists or anti-Semites or anything like that. I genuinely don't think that. But I do think there are fascists yes. and racists who are using these channels deliberately to recruit. I do think that is happening. And I think too little has been done historically uh, since the start of the White Rose to, to prevent that from happening. And so when we see the rhetoric frequently including calls to take a stand and accusations of government violence and Nuremberg trials, it worries me that we see this kind of violent inflammatory rhetoric. And we see here, you know, someone talking about the best thing to do when your government's trying to kill you is to kill them first. Now, people might say that's an obvious plant by someone trying to make the movement look bad. And maybe that's the case. Maybe it isn't. It's very hard to be to be sure. What we do know is from the sticker that was on the lamppost outside your house, people are just two or three clicks away from white nationalism, anti-Semitism and inflammatory language that is calling for violence. And it's easy to say that this worst rhetoric is plants or it's just people just saying, just just venting and that it's all just talk. But the thing is, it's always just talk up until the point it isn't just talk. And at that point, it's, well, how do we miss the warning signs? The warning signs were there the entire time. And the amount of rhetoric that I see that, that calls for quite um, troubling actions worries me that something serious is going to happen. This is radicalization that's happening on our doorsteps. And I think we really need to pay attention to see what we can do to try and talk to people who are unsure in these ways and try to, to get them and encourage them to question the things that they're seeing within the anti-vaccine movement and to, to stand up to the stuff that they think is particularly um, abhorrent and not just let it give a pass. Um, thank you so much for listening. I know we're going to have a break and we're going to have a, a, a Q&A after that. Um, so I look forward to answering. Uh, I'm sure you've got lots and lots of questions. All my information, if you want to contact me, is, is up there. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for listening.
Uh, thank you so much to Marsh because uh, that was fascinating and that you've reminded us of just how dangerous these anti-vaxxer ideas can be and um, given us quite an insight into the way that the anti-vax movement is embedded in so many of these other dangerous conspiracy theories. And of course, being aware of it has to be the first stage in being able to do something about it. Uh, we're going to have a break now. Uh, but before that, can I remind you to head over to Slido to post any questions you have and also to upvote those you'd be most interested in hearing the answers to. A reminder, too, that we'll be meeting afterwards in our local, the online lock-ins razor. Uh, there will, of course, be links to that in the chat. But now it's time to refresh your glasses, do other interval type things, and we'll see you back for the Q&A in 15 minutes at 8.35. Hi, welcome back everyone. Um, the uh, Slido has been really, really active. So obviously you were all listening intently and totally entranced by the talk and uh, have poured out all your questions in the break. So that's really great. Um, the first question I'm going to ask, uh, because I think we need to uh, deal with this first, is what about Marsha's cat? And I'll <laughs> hand that one over to you, Marsh. Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, I do have a cat. She's adorable. She's called Mildred. And um, she, first of all, she's quite scared of this room. Not a big fan of this office. Um, and I tried to get her to come up, but, but right now she's uh, snuggled on my wife's lap in the living room. And there is absolutely no way I'm getting her to uh, to leave that incredibly snuggled position, I'm afraid. So we aren't going to be able to see her wandering around being the uh, furry little idiot that she is, <laughs> essentially, um, because she's she's way too comfortable downstairs. And who can blame her? <laughs> I'd rather be snuggled on someone's lap than sitting in a uh, in a in a cold study. Um, <laughs> so the first question we've got is um, very highly upvoted, and I think I imagine an awful lot of people have been thinking this as you were talking. And that's Andrew from Peterborough asks, "What can I, as an ordinary person, do practically to combat this stuff?" Yeah, I think I think it's tricky, um, but I think there is some stuff we can do. I think. Part of the 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 way that people end up um, very doubled down in an anti-vax position is when they feel like um, they have to take a stand and it has to be binary. And so any amount of hesitancy about vaccination means you're on team anti-vax. And I think one of the things we can do is uh, be sympathetic and compassionate when we're talking to people who have concerns, um, even when we're talking to people incredibly who, who've got very um, vociferous concerns, um, to not write them off, to not make it that uh, it's an us and them. The more tribal we get, the, the less we are willing to talk to one another, the more we just consign people to um, the, the, the sort of radicalization forces, really. So I think we need to keep open the lines of dialogue as much as possible. We need to understand what they're about, and it's why I spend a lot of time in these kind of uh, groups and environments. I'm trying to understand as much as possible how people are communicating with each other and, and what they're saying. Um, and I think we also need to understand that the people we disagree with aren't defined by the thing we, uh, we we shouldn't define them by the characteristic on uh, on which we disagree you know sometimes we can be guilty of assuming the people who are on the other side are de are defined by their worst idea are defined by their worst opinion and so they only exist as a caricature of what we think an anti-vaxxer must be and so people will say oh you know you're you're pro disease you're all about trying to spread disease as much as possible and they're not they're not pro disease they're just as confused and scared as as we are. i mean I, this whole experience has been scary for all of us and the way that manifests is going to be very, very different for different people. So understanding that the people we're talking about are still human is, is a big part of it and that we're still willing to stay in conversation with them and stay uh, with the, the lines of dialogue open. And yeah, when people are hesitant, giving them space to express those hesitation in a way that they don't feel they're going to be instantly judged and written off, I think, can can help. So have you seen people move then? And I, and I was wondering, is it you're saying wait till they're hesitant? Do you think it's pointless saying much before people are expressing their own hesitancy? Um, I don't think it's pointless, because I think before you ever say anything, you think it. Um, you know, so people will express hesitant, the people will, won't necessarily express hesitancy at the moment that they have it, um, especially if what they feel is a, the environment is incredibly tribal. And mm -hmm. I think I've seen this the more time I've spent around conspiracy theory theories generally, um, is when people see it as this is now my group of people, because the other side 
have written me off or the other side see me in this kind of way, it's much harder for them to leave that second group of people because they'll feel like they've got nowhere else to go. So the more we can um, remind people that even if they are saying things that are quite horrible at times or quite, um, quite aggressive, that we aren't being horrible, we aren't being aggressive, we're trying to continue being reasonable and open and non-judgmental. We don't think they're stupid, we don't think they're gullible. I genuinely don't think people are, that, that, you know, people who are anti-vax are stupid or gullible any more than the rest of us are. Um, the, the, the more that we make it clear we're not writing them off in those kind of ways, the easier it will be for people when a little doubt does creep in to come back. Um, I think when they think well, I'm here now and this is my tribe because the other side just call me names and shout at me and and these kind of things, um, then they're not going to change their mind and any nagging doubts that they have, they'll put to the back of their mind because they'll value the community they have around them and they'll see that as their as their their, their people, their, their ability to continue having connections. So we need to stay open and, and willing to talk to people. Right. Um, uh, David asks, how many members of the Telegram groups do you think are actually active and how many people are just lurking i think that was what uh, you know in, because that that you know in terms of reaching these people are do you think they're serious do you think they're being wooed or are they people to reach yeah um so in terms of how active they are i think for the very very big groups a lot of those will be either passive consumers some of them may even be inflated numbers you know people with bot accounts and various other things like that i'm not an expert enough in the telegram platform to understand that but i think that's gonna be an aspect of it once you get into the smaller local groups where you've got like 100 200 300 people i think people are a lot more likely to be active um they may not be always actively contributing conversation but then more likely to be genuinely and authentically listening um, you get some accounts that are in all of the different channels because they're in, you know, they're in 40 different uh, local groups so that when David Avocado Wolf posts something, they can hit send to all of their groups and it'll just fire mm -hmm. those things out. And you get accounts that will just hit forward on pretty much anything. But I think in terms of very active uh, membership of people who who who'll, who'll talk to one, one another a lot, um, of the group of 300, there might be 25 to 30 people who are in there regularly chatting um and i think they're quite active and so in liverpool we they have the the yellow placard protests where they're meeting up on a regular basis to stand on the street corner with placards um a couple of weeks ago there was a, a meeting in liverpool put on by a, a discussion group to talk about the the ethics of vaccine passports and i attended that group because there were 60 people who were going um there was me there was alice and there was 58 members of the local white rose essentially and so that was a, an extraordinary room to be in um and a very interesting room to be in so i think they can call on numbers when it comes to to doing something and being somewhere in person um but yeah so i think i think they are willing to turn up um and and they they are are authentically there for sure that's right. So Dave J asks, uh, what's the most unpleasant thing you've seen endorsed in a Telegram group? I'm not sure I want oh, to hear this, but... I mean, did I not depress you all enough with the stuff that I did show? Mm. I mean, yeah, some of the stuff that I, that I showed there, the stuff that... Um, a Telegram group is relatively unmoderated. There's a very light touch moderation. So a lot of stuff will go in there and then have to be taken down. And there's things that you will see, images that I won't click on because I know that I'm not going to like where this is going, um, that, I, that, I, that I, people getting hurt, various things like that. But I think it's the, the deeply racist, anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant stuff that I've seen, some of which a couple of the images that I showed you, I think that's that's the really, really bad stuff. There was one group called Dismantling the Cabal um, that I found via the really racist one that I found that I that I followed. Um, I followed that through, and that was one of the worst things I've ever seen in terms of the sheer volume of outright hate speech that I saw. And I I quit out of that group very quickly. Um, whereas these other groups I've been in since May. Um, up until the couple of weeks, ago, uh, well, a couple, couple of days ago when I got kicked out of the White Rose group and the White Rose Merseyside group, um, shortly after the link to this talk <laughs> was uh, was posted mm -hmm. to the internet, um, I was very quickly uh, t turfed out of those groups. So, yeah, I think the the really, really abhorrently racist stuff and, and overtly white supremacy material is the stuff that I found really, really troubling, partly because... I can feel how some people would be persuaded to believe it. I can see the framing of it and the way that it's fitting into a worldview that they're piecing together. And it worries me that people will give that a pass. Um, even if they don't necessarily like it, 
they won't call it out. And it's it's you know I don't believe in everything. I don't agree with everything they say, but show me it another fifty times and I might is essentially what I think is happening. All right. So sticking with Telegram for the time being, before you outed yourself, quite obviously, did anyone realise that you weren't sympathetic? Um, I'm not sure. So I didn't say I, I was always I was there mostly to observe. I think when people mm. what I'm to, what I'm when I when I go along to these kinds of things and when I when I when I observe in this kind of way. Um, what I'm trying to find out is how people talk to one another and how they persuade each other of ideas. And I think that changes very significantly when they know there is an outsider in the room. And so I try to be as sort of as uh, as um, um, as fly on the wall as possible without doing so in a way that I think is, is unfair to them. But occasionally, because I've been in these groups for like months now, I didn't realize how long it's actually been. Occasionally, there'd just be some stuff that often wasn't COVID related, where I would just pop up and say a couple of things partly to kind of steer when i could see something going somewhere i would steer it back a little bit so um liverpool was the was the um uh setting of a terrorist attack a couple of weeks ago not actually that far from from my house and the and the the, the house that the police raided was actually even closer to to where i am right now and misinformation sprung up very quickly in the local groups about that including people from the edl coming to liverpool and videoing themselves shouting at local reporters about how they need to close down the local mosque and i pointed out that we didn't need people from outside liverpool coming to liverpool and sharing their hatred here and they agree and the the white rose agreed with me the local liberal group agreed with me and, and and got rid of those people um so that was actually quite encouraging so occasionally i've said some stuff that offered some pushback but if there was ever too much kind of pushback and people started to to think well hang on this person doesn't sound like they're on side I'd, I'd step back a little bit um whenever i would give any pushback about tommy robinson is when i'd get the most opposition um which i thought was interesting like you could say anything about anybody in that group but the second you criticize tommy robinson there'd be three or four people instantly replying to say actually it's all wrong and all the criminal convictions he has they were pinned on him by a corrupt court intentionally to try and silence him. And he did nothing wrong with the mortgage fraud. And when he went to prison, he, he was an innocent victim. And the thing in America he was innocent for. And people would be very, very quick to defend Tommy Robinson. Why um, him? I think because the people who were in the white, some of the people who were in the White Rose group are the admins of Tommy Robinson's channel and members of his his kind of, not necessarily inner circle, but certainly fan club. And so they're there to spread mm -hmm his stuff to those disaffected other people. And so the last thing they will stand for is their leader being called out in that way. That's that's as best as I could tell. It's all anonymous, so I could be entirely wrong in, in that assumption. Right. And Igor asks, uh, did your research give, give you an inside view on how to spot uh, this kind of movement in its infancy and maybe help people from falling victims? Um, oh, gosh, that's hard. I... I nothing nothing specifically stands out that would help me sort of spot it in, in its infancy for the next thing that's happening i think um yeah i'm not sure so i i sort of saw this movement happening from the from the the embers of the, of the flat earth movement can i just, um, can I just in, interrupt for a second so i was going because it just occurred to me do they ever spring up de novo or would they always come up through other conspiracies um that's an interesting question. So like something like QAnon, for example, I think it did spring up. It, it, it sprang out of the, the Pizzagate conspiracy, which then kind of pulled in other things. But I think it was a specific thing that started it. But I imagine a lot of the people who believed it had previously been in other conspiracy groups. And I think there is um, uh, once you're already conditioned or self-conditioned or maneuver you've maneuvered yourself into a position where you're believing in quite intense conspiracy theories um not just a unique thing you know 9-11 was an inside job which was quite a discreet conspiracy princess diana killed by the by the, the 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 uk government quite discreet conspiracy theory once you're believing in something like the flat earth and therefore the entire world governments have to be co collaborating in a lie. It's very easy to find other things the entire world government is, is collaborating and lying about. And I don't think for a second that all COVID, anti-vax, uh, white rose people are flat earthers. I don't think that's true at all. Um, I'd be very surprised if there were many flat earthers who aren't now COVID anti-vaxxers. I'd be very, very surprised by that. So I think there's a snowballing effect. And my worry would be that if when we eventually get out of 
this whole situation and there isn't a long-term uh government scheme to chip us and uh and keep us subject to social control and and, and these various other things that people are worried is a slippery slope um the people who've been radicalized into the the anti-vax movement for 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 covid will be primed to believe the next thing that comes along and that's that's my worry is that I won't be able to spot the thing in its infancy. I might be able to spot as it's happening um, the thing that people are transitioning onto, but I don't know how that helps you prevent people transitioning onto it. We've got a fundamental problem with people who get radicalized into conspiracy theory that you can put out the the the, the single flame, but all of the all of the fuel is still there, the heat source is still there. It's just ready to reignite the next time a, a spark hits it. Right. <laughs> It's not not good news, is it? No, um, um, this isn't one of my happy, joyful uh, talks. I'm no. afraid. <laughs> and um, Igor uh, wonders whether this is already going on in the White Rose Group. Are there talks of monoatomic lizards from the inside of the from the inside of the flat Earth there yet? Um, so it has been. So there have been flat Earthers in the White Rose Group, uh, and I think um, it, it it essentially. Because it's because the pandemic is everything for everyone right now. It rules our lives in a more significant way than any other event in the last, you know, borderline century, well, fifty years, sixty years, or however long you know since the Second World War. Um, then there's more people whose lives are being affected by it, and therefore more people are being drawn to it. And those people will bring their own preconceived ideas and their own existing um, conspiracy theories to it. So. Even in the room of people I was in a couple of, like a week and a half ago who were there to talk about vaccine passports, I don't think they'd have agreed whether COVID was real, whether it was a bioweapon engineered in China or whether it was an entire hoax uh, or whether it was just a rebadging of the flu. They wouldn't necessarily agree whether masks are useful or not. They wouldn't necessarily agree whether the vaccine was designed to kill you or was killing you by accident. They'd all have different views on all those things. And many of them would bring in their views about the new world order is behind all of the governments and they're just pushing people as far as they can go deliberately. Um, as I say, th in the light paper, David Icke is in there occasionally. He's got an advert on it uh, on, on the back of most of them. Um, so the David Icke ideas come through. Occasionally I've seen David Icke videos share, shared into the White Rose. It's sort of a clearing ground for whatever you believe that isn't what the mainstream believes at the moment. Some of these ideas catch on and get embedded and, and sort of take hold and others are transient and pass through and it's it's hard to really get a feel for for which one's going to be which and there's a sort of a specific question about conspiracies from an uh, anonymous person who wonders uh, are there any homophobic or anti-trans messages alongside are, you know are there aids conspiracies or vaccines causing transgenderism going along yeah we we do, do see some of that uh, to be honest absolutely um there's there's the there is a long-standing conspiracy trope that um this person who's famous is actually of a is of a different gender you know this person this person was really a man and they're hiding this truth from you the entire time and that sort of comes up in there a little bit as well um there's essentially any moral panic can be wrapped into it and so in the UK, we're, we're currently experiencing a very significant moral panic around trans rights and, and people sort of uh, uh, putting trans rights on the blocks uh, in, in the service of this moral panic. In the US, we're seeing it with critical race theory um, and the, the way that race is being talked about. And both those things get wrapped in occasionally. And so I do see some some uh, transphobia in there. I do and, and part of the, the, the racism, I think, is kind of tied to the American moral panic over critical race theory. Uh, and then suddenly we see um, the uh, we see climate change coming up being talked about in the same ways. And oddly enough, across all the different Cons uh, sources of misinformation that I regularly consume, including um, in in Telegram for the White Rolls, in QAnon channels, including the newsletters that I get from um, from various um, unusual groups of sovereign citizens and things, um, and the, the Catholic Herald, um, the 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 few things of the Catholic Stand rather, and uh, the few things that they the three topics I can see that they agree on universally, and I can't see any disagreement anywhere is. Uh, critical race theory, trans rights, and climate change. They agree that all of those things are you know, evil. Um, and that seems to be a, a uniquely identifying point for lots of different conspiracy theorists and pseudoscientists. And, and so therefore we see it playing out in the, the various Telegram channels that I'm in. Well, I'm just going to remember what you said then. It was all of the... Oh, I've forgotten it now. <laughs> so much from my memory. All of the uh, many sources of misinformation that I regularly consume... Yeah. That sounds quite a life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a living. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> so, um, Paul, 
aka Picticule, asks, you say that White, White Rose is a decentralised movement. Are you aware of any efforts to take central control? Would that make it more or less effective? Um, I don't th I don't think I've seen anything that would uh, be taken central control. There's people making sort of suggestions. So at one point they were going to crowdfund to put a, a big uh, advertising hoarding. I think in Manchester they were buying up the space to put one of their white rose stickers on there. And they tried to use GoFundMe um, to to gather money for that. And I know GoFundMe, I think it was GoFundMe shut that down, either that or just giving. I think it was GoFundMe um, that, that got shut down. So there was a level of an attempt to lead on a project there, but there's nobody trying to control or direct the movement. And I think in part that's because um, they almost by definition attract people who um, won't follow what an authority will tell them. It's incredibly anti-authoritarian. And, you know, I, I commend that. I agree that we shouldn't just blindly follow authority. Um, I also think we shouldn't blindly not follow authority in the sense of just because an authority says it doesn't mean it isn't true. That it, it, it's it's kind of, it can be truth agnostic uh, or authority agnostic, essentially. Yeah. Um, so I haven't seen any attempt to do that. And I, I don't think, I don't think they would be very receptive to that. I think everybody who's joined the movement has joined it because they feel it's something that they can just contribute to in that kind of way. The most that I've seen in terms of attempts to control it are from these um, external channels that are trying to pour COVID misinformation, well, put out more COVID misinformation in their normal output in order to fish people into their channel where they can control them. So mm. where we see, you know, Mark Steele, I think, is one example, Kate Shemarani being another, Tommy Robinson, another, and those white supremacy groups. Um, I think they're not trying to control the white rose. They're trying to fish in the pools of the white rose and get people into a space that they do control and where they can control them. And related to that, and thinking about the, the lack of cent centralization, if it's decentralized, where do the stickers designs come from? Because uh, <laughs> Yeah, again, it's it's anybody can put forward ideas for stickers and anybody who's got a copy of whatever image editor you like. They, most of the sticker designs are text on a white background and the text is a font that you can download. So people will kind of float um, sticker ideas and if people like them enough, they'll get added to the, the repository and people can decide from there which ones to do. So it is, I've had this conversation with journalists uh, for, for various publications about why I'm concerned about the white rules and they've been, uninterested in it because there isn't a organization behind it that you can point to a leader of there isn't a source of funding it's not like you can say oh this whole thing has been you know funded by these extremists because it doesn't need that much funding um if people can't afford to get a printer to get the labels they can mm. message a bot on telegram and the bot will with their address and people will send you stickers through the post in a little pack you know send you 50 in an envelope or something um they do see it as a collaborative movement and it is, it is, as far as I can tell, a decentralized collaborative movement where they're helping each other with their goals. It's just, I, I unfortunately think their goals are are misguided and are, and are doing harm and are, are making them prone to radicalization too. Right. They, there's been um, a number of questions on the next uh, next topic. Asurda has asked this one. He asks, how do they justify contradictory ideas like there is no COVID with ivermectin works? Yeah, I, I think I don't think they will do that kind of self-examination as to see where that contradiction is, partly because what they're doing is just they're drawn because it's it's disputing the mainstream narrative. And I think for a lot of people, and this is just kind of speculation, I'm not in anybody's head, um, for a lot of people, the things that they are, are saying when they're when they're talking either to each other or to people who um, believe the mainstream narrative they're things that they think will change people's minds. They're not necessarily what, it's not necessarily what changed their mind. Um, a lot of people will, I honestly think a lot of people are coming to their conclusions about the pandemic based first of all on their emotion. Because I, I think we all come to our, our conclusions and our decisions based first on our emotion and what fits our value system, what fits who we are. And then we backfill with evidence and backfill with logic. And the best that we can do is to try to train ourselves so that our emotions fit what can be evidenced by reasonable logic. But we all make decisions based on emotions kind of all the time, really. You know, the things that we question are the things that disagree with us, not the things that agree with us, because the, the things that agree with us don't don't cause friction. Um, so, yeah, I think that's what's happening is they're not questioning the things that they're only questioning the things that they disagree with. And then they're throwing out the arguments that they think disagree with those things. Yeah. You remind me of something I read once, which was that our whole thinking slow mechanism wasn't designed or it didn't arise in order to uh, work things out carefully. But it arose in order to justify to other people what yeah. we initially thought. 
Yeah, exactly. I've, I've come to the decision and now I'm going to find out why. Um, yes. it's, it's kind of a, a lot of what I'm going to do. justify to, to you why. I, I don't care why. Well, either or, or justify to themselves, justify yeah. to yourself. I think because the, the, to, to convince someone else, you sort of have to convince yourself yeah. first. Um, and, and that's why I get very, uh, that's why I think it's really important that people who will, will define themselves as skeptics and critical thinkers um, remain aware of the fact that the, the decisions you're making are still based on emotional impulses and, uh, and your, what, what fits your value system, what fits your identity, what fits how you see the world. Um, once we start seeing ourselves as as inerring process, logical processes of information, we just blind ourselves to or completely close ourselves off to our biases and therefore our biases affect us way more. Um, being aware of your bias is the best defence you have against your bias. And so unfortunately that's not what we see with the white rose. And I, and I think, I honestly think a lot of it comes down to, um, to, to fear and confusion, um, uncertainty when, when, when your life is suddenly upended by uncertainty. And especially when that uncertainty has a big effect in your lives and people lost their jobs, that people, um, lost their income, their livelihoods. And that was a massive, massive change in their lives. And for some people they could square that off with, this is terrible. What's happening to me. Also, what's happening in the world is terrible. This is two terrible things sitting next to each other. For other people, it's like, well, this terrible thing happened to me and there must be a cause. There must be a, a blame. There must be someone who's in charge and control of that. And therefore, the big pandemic isn't real. And therefore, I can blame the people who are faking the pandemic for all the bad things that happened to me. And that externalizing of the effects of random chance on our lives is um, a way of grasping comfort in an uncomfortable situation and grasping certainty where there's only uncertainty. So a common thing in, in conspiracies. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, listeners, yeah I, I mean, I'm thinking of your talk on the flat earthers and mm -hmm. so much of this relates to that, both the believing five different contradictory things at the same time and feeling reassured by it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, there's a there's a reassuring thing, and also there's a there's a camaraderie of um, we can all get through this if we just recognise that the bad guys are these bad guys, and we just need to stand up to them and say no, resist, stand up. We refuse to comply with your uh, with your your measures, and then the whole thing topples. And unfortunately, that would work if there really was a shadowy evil cabal in charge of stuff. It wouldn't work if the thing that's making all these things happen is a microscopic particle uh, that is replicating and causing death. And the problem is, yeah, you can't, you can't resist a virus. You can only uh, take as many preventative measures as possible. Right. There's a, another question from Igor coming up next. He asks, um, is this movement just a UK thing or is it part of something wor worldwide? Is it is it the UK version of quit? He asks. Um, I'm not sure what quit is, but it's it's not just a UK thing. It's um it, it's very large in, in the UK, very large in the US, and very large in it's getting quite large in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so English language, and that makes sense because the telegrams in English, the um the stickers originally are in English, but they are now being translated. They've got a growing movement in other countries, but in terms of proliferation of local groups, it's certainly England, the US, and uh, and Australia. Um. I would be very unsurprised to see it growing in other areas. So it is the stickers are increasingly available in other languages. And again, all it takes is somebody who's interested in the movement to have access to Photoshop and the files are there to to edit and, and change. So it's 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 very easy. That they're, they're designed to be low maintenance, low design, low effort, um, in order to to aid their proliferation. And so that's that's why it's so easy for them to spread. It's kind of interesting to see it evolve and see the messaging evolve in that way. Um, we're almost seeing kind of anti-vaccine variants. Is that well, this particular argument was effective at the time, but then we developed an answer to that, which is we're no longer worried about it because we've got vaccines that do this. And therefore the anti-vaccine movement has to mutate mm -hmm. to have a new variant that can can be relevant to what's currently happening. And so we sort of see that it's spreading across borders in the same way that the virus spreads. Um, back to the, still, still with the White Rose people, uh, someone anonymous says, uh, nice talk. What are the demographics of people in the White Rose groups? Are they middle-aged older people or youngsters, varied? Um, so it's really hard to tell because a lot of it is a screen name. Occasionally people put their real names up. You'll have noticed in my talk that when I could see real names, I would mm. I would uh, blank those out because I don't think it's fair to put people's names up in that way. But very few people would go by their full name. 
Um, not many people would put their profile photo up, so we can only kind of really guess. Um, the meeting that I was at about vaccine passports, where a lot of uh, a lot of the local white rose attended, I would say was maybe 55, 45 in terms of women, so more women than men. Um, the majority of people were in their, I'd say, 50s, 60s or older, with very few people in like under 30. I don't know if that was just a function of who could get to the event and various things like that. Um, in terms of some of the, the yeah, I, I think that's about as far as I can go, really. I, I don't know. Um, I, I can't judge people's level of, you know, socioeconomic status mm. and education, things like that. I don't think that's fair to do remotely. I, I didn't get the sense that there were that it was it was overrun by the landed aristocracy. Um, so I, I think it was more um, people like me and people like the areas that I grew up in, basically. Yeah. Ian asks, what do you think the end game is for organisations like White Rose? Um, that's tricky, really, because the end game is that they want everyone to realise that a pandemic isn't real or that the pandemic is real, but the virus isn't harmful isn't. or that the vaccine is harmful or that vaccine passports are a intentional tool of the government trying to subjugate us into social control. So the end game is always to say no to whatever is happening essentially, um, to stand up to whatever measures are being brought in. So when it was just masks, the end game was to not wear masks. Um, and then the vaccine came in and the and the, vac and the end game was to not wear a vaccine, uh, not to not take the vaccine, really. Um, I don't think they have a, a an agenda in the sense of and in five years time we'll be here. It's just, well, maybe they do in the sense of they a lot of them would genuinely think that if they don't do what they're doing now, in five years' time, we'll be living under a totalitarian state where you are chipped and you, if you disagree with the government at all, they'll turn off your source of income. They won't allow you to go anywhere at all and you'll be a, cast out into a two-tier society. And the end game is for that not to happen. Now, oddly enough, I, my end game is, that for, is for that not to happen. And I think if they do nothing and I do nothing, it won't happen. Um, but the, the the big conspiracy around, you know, the great reset, the new normal, the 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 great kind of um, the, uh, the various of the terms they use for these things, um, it's all towards this big new world order, one world government, global control, basically, that is what they think is happening. And the end goal is to, is to anything but that, basically. That's really helpful because... If you think about it as let's not wear masks or let's not have vaccines, it sounds like a toddler stamping their foot. But obviously, people wouldn't devote that much energy into being a toddler stamping their foot, would they? They There must be something more important in it. And, so, and the, yeah. the, the fear of totalitarian control may, it sounds reasonable. Yeah. And at the, at the same time, so I, completely. But at the same time, I think maybe some of that is also the justification for why emotionally I don't feel I want to do this. I don't want to wear a mask because mm -hmm. they're uncomfortable and horrible and, and I don't like it. And what's the justification of that? Well, actually, it's the first step on a slippery slope and I don't want to get the end of the slope. And that's, I, I was right all along yeah. to not want to wear a mask. I found my justification. So I also can't tease it apart in mm -hmm. terms of that. It's, it's, I don't think it's possible to tease apart because I think they sort of either exist in a flux state between how much you genuinely believe it, where it's going and how much it's a justification to yourself as to as to your your uh, emotional response to things. I think it's kind of, it, it, the, the two are sort of intertwined uh, irrevocably. All right. Um, Garnet asks, uh, I see many stickers in the same areas as uh, Expos Pfizer, the band video, WW band video, Alex Jones graffiti. I'm not sure what he's talking about but do you know of any crossover um i, I don't know expose Pfizer or the, or the alex jones uh video but i it wouldn't surprise me that it's it, that's inhabiting the same spaces because i imagine it will be from the same kinds of people essentially it'll be the, the anybody who was who was drawn to um that kind of not only do i follow a conspiracy theory they wouldn't see it as a conspiracy theory but not only do i follow that but i'm willing to go out on the street and proclaim it through graffiti I would be surprised that they didn't come across the, the White Rose and, and become part of it because it's exactly the kind of people that the White Rose is looking for, mm. people who are willing to take the message out on the street. So it, it doesn't surprise me at all that they will exist in the same space. Um, there's a, a graffiti artist in Liverpool called uh, Cine Missioni um, who stencils um, things on on various parts of kind of, uh, of, of public space, sometimes inspirational quotes from Bob Marley and various other people, and sometimes anti-vax weirdness and uh, and stuff, and will post anti-vax stuff to his Telegram. And I would be, I don't know that that person has gone out and put um, uh, white rose stickers on, uh, on places, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. 
Um, do you think that those stickers have been effective in recruiting new converts? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's the only way people find uh, the white rose. Um, I don't know. So I don't know. How, I don't know exactly how it started. I haven't tracked it down to the original kind of first kernel of an idea. But as far as I'm aware, the only people who the only way you can really find out about it is by seeing a sticker on something and thinking, well, I'm going to check out that uh, that telegram. We've certainly seen the numbers growing. We've certainly seen the group sizes growing. Um, when I some of the screenshots from this talk um, were taken from May, where a group would have 90 people in, and now it has 300. Um, at one point. The, the White Rose group, I think when I was in it, had like 10,000, now it's got 50,000. Um, I, I think when I've detailed in an article for The Skeptic, um, I've, I've written all of this up. And I think I've even, I've detailed there what the numbers were when I first found it and what the numbers were when I wrote that article. And those numbers will be different to what I'm seeing today because they've they've grown so much. Um, I, I, I wish I kept track of the numbers as I've seen them, but it's certainly been growing. And the only way I can think of it growing is from those stickers going out because that's the point of the stickers. Right, so removing those hard to remove stickers isn't a bad idea. Whenever I see them, I take them down. Mm. And we've come on to our last question now, which is from Serda, who asks, do you think that deplatforming locks these groups into confined spaces? If so, what would be a better way or is to, to break them? Is there a next step to, to break this? Yeah, that's interesting. So in terms of deplatforming, um, I, I don't know that they that they've been deplatformed as such in the sense that they put stickers up. I think taking those stickers down is is absolutely fine. You know, the the, the free speech of putting a sticker up is sort of matched by the free speech of sort of taking a sticker down. I think I, I don't think um, the the I don't have any qualms about that. Um, and I I would agree with them being deplatformed in the sense of I don't want the BBC to say well now let's hear from them uh, from 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 people in those spaces. I know that when I was at this this vaccine meeting, people were very angry about the fact that their viewpoints are never expressed in the mainstream media. Um, and so that's why they turn to places like the light paper, because you can't ever hear anyone who disagrees with the vaccine on the mainstream news. Um, I did wonder whether they would therefore follow that maxim through to say, well, why aren't we hearing any pro-vaccine voices in the light paper? And how how censored is the rest of the world from those papers? You know, And, and I think People are in their echo chambers, but I don't think they're in their echo chambers because they're being driven out of other conversations. I think they're they're coming to, yeah. to together with people who agree with them and finding kind of fellow travellers and and people who are sympathetic to them. Um, the way I think we get out of that or get people out of that is to try to find. It, you won't be able to go into your local white rose space uh, on Telegram and say, hi, I think you're incorrect, but let's have a good chat about it because I suspect you'd be shot down pretty quickly and probably ejected. Um, I've seen people come in and not do it in a nice way and say, you guys are all idiots. And of course, they're going to be uh, shot down and, and ejected. And I'd, I'd support them being ejected. Don't turn up to conversations and and presume to know better and presume to be um, writing people because you look like an arrogant idiot and uh, you being ejected is, is quite right for that. Um, Anything we can do to keep the lines of communication open, I think, is really important and to not close ourselves off and to not see ourselves as other than or superior to. Um, they're, they're human beings. They're in the same society that we are. And anything we can do to keep them connected in that society, I think, is is the only way we get people back out. But I don't think you can do it by going into the White Rose group and, and trying to fish them into more reasonable places to counteract the, the, the people who are trying to fish them into less reasonable places. Right. Actually, one more question has just popped up. Um, it's a worry that uh, Igor had heard about. He wonders if there, he'd heard that there are talks about hidden razor blades in stickers to prevent them being destroyed. Is there any truth in that? Um, not that I really think. I think maybe a couple of examples somewhere, not even necessarily white roll stickers. I think there were maybe stickers for something else. The ones that I saw, they weren't white roll stickers. Um, no one in the white rolls that I've seen has talked about doing that. When I've seen people talking in the white rolls talking about that happening, they've been condemning it, saying, oh, this is bullshit just designed to make us look bad. Nobody would really do that. We're not here to try and hurt people. Um, so I think... There might have been a couple of examples of it happening or something that seemed like it was that in the sense that somebody went to take a sticker off and there was something sharp already underneath because of the surfaces you're putting it on. I'm not sure. Um, but I think there were stories in the newspapers about that. And I, I personally think those stories are overblown. Um, I've taken quite a lot of stickers down and I've never seen anything like that. And I've never seen anybody report that that's something that they've they've seen. So I, I think that might be. Uh, a little bit of a moral panic on our side on that one. Right, good. Well, that, that's that's very reassuring, and also paints a less nasty picture of other people. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so, well, um, thank you very much. 
uh, that was not the most um, uplifting talk, but certainly, <laughs> but I mean, it's certainly really enlightening and really something that we needed to hear. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank and, you. And I, and I really enjoy talking about these things. So, yeah, thanks for yeah, thanks everyone for having we enjoy listening to you. So uh, to everyone else, that, that, that about wraps it up for this year. Thank you all so much for being with us and for the tremendous support that we've all felt. It's been a real privilege working with uh, Skeptics in the Pub, on, the Skeptics in the Pub Online team. And actually, we'd all feel a bit silly without our wonderful viewers and all your participation. So thank you for turning up every week and then every fortnight. We're working hard on next year's lineup. So keep an eye out on social media and for our newsletter. And uh, we'll soon be knowing how the next instalment of 2022 begins. Time now to head over to Lockins Razor uh, after a final big show of thanks, please, in our chat for our excellent speaker tonight, Michael Marshall. Thank you.